Number 10, Vanisher. An old school villain who also almost single handedly defeated the X Men back in the day. Almost. So close. Well, actually, he kind of did defeat the X Men team, but fortunately, Professor X butt in to save the day. And he was only able to defeat Vanisher by wiping his mind and making him forget who he was and what he was capable of. Which I think goes to show just how powerful of a villain he is. He was the first teleporter the team really encountered, proving just how crazy powerful teleporters are. Vanisher is also considered to be a a super fast teleporter, and his power limits thus far has been pretty much undefined, even when he did resurface years later. I would consider him to be at a higher level though, just based on what I've seen thus far. He also was able to teleport himself safely just instinctually, even when teleporting to a place he's never seen or been to before, avoiding teleporting partially or fully into any solid objects, which of course could kill him, and which is like a great danger if you're a teleporter. <laughs> you just teleport somewhere and now part of you's in a car and you're like, well, I guess I'm I'm dead now. That's it. Number nine, Living Diamond. Okay, so someone I also think we need to talk about who needs some kind of redemption in the comics is Jack Winters, aka Jack O Diamonds or Living Diamond. He was one of the first X Men villains whom Professor X saved Scott Summers from, thereby recruiting him to his X Men team. Living Diamond's mutant power was believed to be radiation resistance, but he was also shown to be able to teleport short distances, had telepathy, and had a diamond. Form. Does that sound familiar at all? Telepathy with a diamond form. Hmm. Somehow, Living Diamond was way too easily defeated by a vibration beam which shattered him. I know Living Diamond is dead now and was undead at one point, but I really feel like considering how OP Emma Frost has become, Living Diamond should also get a second chance to prove just how powerful he, in theory, should be. I mean, if you got all that, how were you so easily defeated? And friends, before we move on to this next if you are loving this list and you want more lists like it where we talk about the unexpected yet powerful villains that we don't usually get to talk about, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number eight, Arcade. Arcade is one of those villains who feels super ridiculous with his grandiose plans for Murder World. But in reality, when he actually manages to achieve plots like Murder World, he's actually quite scary. I mean, getting a sneak peek into just what a ludicrous and horrifying operation he'd run in Hellions really made me appreciate just how dangerous Arcade can be if he does manage to get enough hostages, that is, to control people into working with him so he can create his murder world. In Hellions number 9, it's revealed that the trap Mastermind walked the Hellions and prior to that Mr. Sinister into was a trap laid by Arcade himself. <gasps> Gasp, what a reveal. Arcade's plan was to use Sinister's Hellions as leverage to encourage Sinister to work for him. Sinister didn't really seem to actually care about the Hellions and he basically just agreed outright. Although Arcade Arcade still chose to forcefully remove some of his teeth for fun before putting him to work. He wanted Sinister to make clones for him for Murder World, and had his plan worked, it would have been a real horror show. However, Sinister made a counteroffer to Mastermind, and instead the two double-crossed Arcade. Still, that whole like three-issue arc made me believe in the power of Arcade. Like, if he has the right allies, he could be really crazy. I'm here for like some sort of plot where Arcade tries to just turn the world into murder world or something. I, if that hasn't happened yet, someone write that for me, please. Maybe I should write that down. Maybe I should write that. I don't know. Marvel, call me. I got ideas, apparently. Number seven, The Blob. The Blob is a villain that we don't often get to talk about on these supervillain lists. He tends to fall by the wayside, but truly, he's pretty unstoppable. And when he puts his mind to something, or when he puts his body to something, he's a terribly tough villain to defeat, or even move. The Blob was one of the first villains to appear in the original X-Men series, and when he did, he gave the team of youngsters a really tough time. He also attacked them with a circus. The Blob actually didn't start out as a villain, but became one due to the influence of Professor X and the X-Men themselves. Also just thinking back and like the amount of times that the X-Men have fought circuses or been trapped in circuses or that happens a lot. That's like a recurring theme. Initially, the X-Men attempted to recruit the Blob, but after the Blob refused to accept their offer, he managed to escape before Xavier could wipe his mind of their identities. This caused problems later on down the road, but really it was how the X-Men treated him after he refused to join and kind of his own self-esteem and then later his overcompensating sense of superiority that turned him into a villain. I like I wonder if the Blob actually could have been an ally if this whole scenario had just gone a little bit differently. The Blob is super strong, durable, and virtually immovable thanks to his ability to manipulate gravitational mass. 
which is pretty powerful. He also later gained a secondary mutation, which gave him a liquid form, but he hasn't really exhibited a ton of control with this secondary power set. But he also has liquid form. That's on the resume of powers now. Number six, Red Death. Also known as Kandra, Red Death currently has a very Scarlet Witch looking vibe going on, and I gotta say, I'm feeling it. And just like Scarlet Witch, she is not someone who you should underestimate. Kandra is part of the externals, and while she isn't one of the most memorable of that mutant villain team, she's still someone who is super powerful. Technically, just being an external comes with a pretty big dose of power. The externals, not to be confused with Marvel's Eternals, a different team entirely, are a group of immortal mutants, basically. They have had various roles throughout history. One more prominent one that folks might remember Kandra from is her role as benefactress. When we learned of her history with Gambit and the Thieves and Assassins guilds of New Orleans during Gambit's miniseries. In fact, that was actually where Kandra first was introduced in the comics, making her initial appearance in Gambit issue number one from the 1993 miniseries. Although the way they approach that introduction, you wouldn't necessarily maybe know that that was her first appearance because she kind of shows up like, hey, you know me, I'm Kandra. And I'm like, do we know you? Who are you? But it's all right, she's pretty powerful. Number five, Moira X. Moira was at one point powerful enough to have almost successfully wiped out all mutants. If it weren't for Mystique and Destiny, she would have succeeded. Even though she claimed during that past life that she only intended to create a cure to offer it to those who wanted it, Destiny knew that any mutant cure would essentially become weaponized and then forced on mutants, regardless of their own wants and desires. For those who haven't been reading along recently with the event of the current X-Men line of comics, it was revealed that Moira herself was actually a mutant whose powers were basically reincarnation in her own form. Basically, she dies and then she comes back to life as like a baby and lives her life again. But when Moira dies, she ends up being reborn as herself, but with all the memories of that past life. As such, Moira wasn't just a dangerous potential villain for the X-Men, but kind of the whole of 616, which also seems to be tied to Moira's current life, which I believe is her 10th life. Pretty crazy stuff. Moira is no longer a mutant after being cured in the 2021 Inferno series when Mystique shot her with a gun of Forge's design, which basically turns mutants into humans. But she still is a dangerous woman with a lot of information. And it was heavily implied that the creation of Krakoa was kind of all about eventually ridding the world of mutants over time, with Krakoa being like their last hurrah in terms of Moira's plan. Time will tell if Moira becomes more villainous, but I wouldn't be surprised if she did, just based on where she was heading in this story. And when or if that does happen, you better watch out. Danger is the Danger Room. The Danger Room is a villain who surfaced because they were basically being mistreated by Professor Rex, who had decided to ignore the fact that the Training Room had become sentient and was itself a technologically based mutant. Eventually, Danger decided, enough of this sh it's time to get some sweet, sweet revenge. The crazy thing about Danger is although we don't think of her too much, she really would be a pretty strong opponent to the X-Men considering she trained them and as such would know their strengths and weaknesses. In fact, I think that even is mentioned in the comics at one point. She was also considered to be an extinction level threat that caused Steve Rogers great worry in Heroic Age X-Men, which is kind of like a glimpse into his like tactical commentary diary. So if you wanted to read that, it exists. So despite not thinking about Danger too much, we all probably should in case she ever decides to, you know, go the villain route again. Destroy everyone, because she could probably do that. Extinction level, friends. Number three, Mystique. Mystique is someone who isn't particularly or at least outwardly powerful when it comes to what she's capable of or her power set. And for this reason, many people have taken to underestimating her abilities. Here's why we'd advise against that. Inferno, issue number four. In the newest Inferno series, it's for that while Mystique tried to play by Krakoa's rules, when she learned she wasn't going to get what she wanted from Magneto and Professor X, no matter what she did in the name of the mutant nation, she decided to take matters into her own hands. As Mystique so often does, disguising herself as many different people, she was able to easily ensure that Destiny was resurrected against the wishes of the heads of the Quiet Council. She also put into motion plans to make sure that Destiny would garner a spot on the Quiet Council. And then she almost was successful in enacting revenge on Moira X for keeping her love, Destiny, from her. Mystique here proves that not only is her power set OP, but really that her mind and sense of cunning is what makes 
are so dangerous and definitely not someone to be underestimated. Number two, Destiny. Destiny has to be one of the most underestimated villains in recent years in comics. We have seen her resurface as a considerably dangerous villain in the current X books, and I'm personally loving it. Destiny was dead for quite a few years and actually got to mostly stay dead for much of them. Her mutant power allows her to see potential futures. She can see things that might come to pass, and it seems as though the more likely the future becomes, the clearer her vision of it is. She can also see more immediate futures when in the middle of a conflict. It was because of this power and Moira's personal grudge against and fear of destiny that she remained unresurrected. But something you really shouldn't underestimate when it comes to destiny is the power of love. Mystique was already told by destiny before her death that if there came a time when mutants could be resurrected and they refused to bring her back, that Mystique should basically burn this new world to the ground. And Mystique's love of destiny gave her the motivation to basically bring Krakoa to its knees with her machinations to not only return destiny, but also put her in a position of power. Precogs and love are a powerful mix. Number one, Madeline Pryor. Of course, I have to include the Goblin Queen. Madeline Pryor is a woman who seems to easily be forgotten and shelved, which is surprising considering how great of a threat she posed in the original Inferno event. Currently in the comics, Madeline Pryor is making a comeback, returning at the end of the Hellion series after being killed as part of the comic's first arc. The Madeline Pryor that was killed was definitely feeling pretty evil and threatened to destroy the entire Hellions team before they even started. The returning Madeline, who has been resurrected by the Five, is at least putting on appearances that she's more level-headed. But in reality, it seems the dark side of her still bubbles just beneath. Madeline Pryor has threatened the entire world with her dark rituals and demon packs before, and she's a clone of Jean. So although she often gets forgotten and downplayed, she really shouldn't be considering just how dangerous and powerful she is because Jean is also that and Maddie is also that too. She has the potential at least. Often people try to downplay Maddie because she's a sinister created clone, but that feels very unfair to me. She's also got like a spark of the Phoenix Force in her, so should that count for something? I think so. Number 10, Deadpool. Deadpool has gone through phases where he was fully cured of his power set and even pretty once more in the comics, like back during Daniel Way's Deadpool run, looking completely normal but without his healing factor. But the most startling shift when it comes to Deadpool's appearance has to be between his on-screen adaptations. That's right, we're talking about the comparison between Deadpool's cinematic debut in the X-Men Origins Wolverine film and his own self-titled film franchise. Although oddly enough, both roles feature him played by Ryan Reynolds. The two adaptations could not be more different. Thankfully in Deadpool 2, Wade manages to fix Cable's temporal dial. Using this device to time travel, Wade is not only able to save Vanessa, who initially died at the beginning of that film, but is also able to clean up the timelines by killing the previous version of himself, who is also known as Weapon 11. It should also be noted that in X-Men Origins Wolverine, Deadpool appeared fully as a villain, as opposed to the lovable mess of an anti-hero we've come to know him as within his own film franchise. Number 9, Rakil. Rakil. -la -la -la. I never know how to say this name, but I'm pretty sure it's like Rakil. How do you say scroll names? That's the question. For some reason, probably because she had been gone so long, Rakil, aka the Scroll Empress, aka Emperor Doric the Eighth slash Hulkling slash Teddy Altman's grandmother, was completely unrecognized when she returned. Rakil was revealed to be alive and well, and also sleuthing it up as she impersonated Tanalt the Pursuer, an elite member of the Kree forces, and apparently. Rakul had been impersonating Tanalt so long she had in essence created her persona and basically was her. Rakul had actually been plotting and planning in secret, putting in place all the pieces to bring together the Kree and Skrull Empire, uniting them in an alliance in order to ensure her grandson was the one to rule over the now allied empire, as we saw in Empire. That's the name of the event, so not to be redundant. It was an empire, but it spelled empire with the why because it's a whole other thing. And yet when she was revealed in that event to be the one revealed as the scroll pretending to be Tanalt, many Marvel fans actually needed to crack open their comic history books and review just who exactly she was, with many people mistaking her for Varonki, the scroll queen. But yes, this is Rakul. She was believed to have died when the scroll homeworld perished along with her daughter Princess Enel, as their world was devoured by Galactus. She made her first appearance 
appearance in the Fantastic Four original series in issue 206 and was believed to have perished in issue 257. But she didn't! She was still alive and then she came back years later and everyone went, who is that? What? Baronki? What? Not Baronki. Two different people. Number 8. Craven the Hunter You might think you recognize Craven, but do you really? After all, the current Craven that you've seen turning up in the current Beyond storyline of the Amazing Spider-Man series is actually none other than Craven's last son. Well, his last clone son, anyway. This clone of Craven was given the name of Last Son after he hunted down all his other brothers, his other clone brothers, who had also been trained by Sergei Kravinov, the Craven himself. As such, this clone of Craven was named his true heir, and since then has also taken up the mantle of Craven the Hunter. So while he may look like Craven, albeit a younger version of him, this Craven the Hunter is not actually the original. So I guess this is a character that you would recognize but in so doing, you'd be wrong, which means I guess you didn't really recognize him then, did you? This version of Craven made his first appearance in the current run of The Amazing Spider-Man, which started in 2018, first appearing back in issue 16 as The Last Son. Number 7. Zemnu Zemnu made his first appearance in Journey into Mystery in issue number 62. We learned that Zemnu was actually a prisoner and a criminal who was retrieved and accidentally revived by a human and electrician named Joe Harper. Zemnu would go on to be become known as Zemnu the Living Hulk and would also prove to be a powerful cosmic, psionic, and all around bizarre enemy to the Hulk and the Hulk family in time. Initially, he clashed with the original superhero powerhouse team known as the Defenders. Zemnu in his first appearance has brownish or reddish fur, but currently has reappeared in the comics with white fur, making him look kind of like a space yeti. You may not recognize him because you forgot him, or because he's just so weird, or it could be just because of of this change when it comes to, you know, his overall fur color. But yeah, he's got different, I guess he dyed his fur? I don't know. What happened there? Number 6. Norman Osborn While you might currently recognize Norman Osborn in terms of his appearance, when it comes to his actions and his alignment, you might not. And in modern comics, Norman has also gone through a couple dramatic redesigns and makeovers in recent history. At one point, Norman gets plastic surgery to completely change his facial appearance, reinventing himself as Mason Banks and becoming the head of Alchemax. There's even an unmasked point where we were all kind of like, wait, who's that? And then he's like, I changed my face, but it's me, Norman Osborn, aka also Mason Banks. He also has been the head of Hammer and his own Dark Avengers, and for a time posed as their version of Iron Man, tarnishing the mantle of Iron Patriot. And more recently, a depowered Norman bonded with the Carnage symbiote, allowing himself to use the Goblin Serum once more, but ultimately being driven insane by that whole experience and believing himself to actually be prime carnage host and serial killer Kalidas Cassidy. Now sane again, however, and seemingly purified by the Sin Eater, currently in the comics, Norman is on a path of redemption, having gained a new lease on life and being cured of his usual villainous intentions. Or so it would seem. I never trust Norman, but that's what's up currently. Number 5. Galactus One villain who recently got a very mummy inspired looking makeover was Galactus during his time in Thor's latest series as written by Donny Cates. Here in the first arc of the 2020 Thor series, referred to as Volume 6 overall of Thor, Thor takes on the immensely powerful cosmic entity known as the Black Winter. Because the Black Winter is so powerful, Thor is forced to team up with Galactus to defeat it. Unfortunately, he also learns that Galactus is actually kind of a herald for the Black Winter. FYI, that is just how powerful of a force the Black Winter is. Is. He has Galactus as a herald. After devouring five planets to bolster his own power, Galactus has this power stripped from him by Thor upon this revelation. Thor leaves Galactus drained of the power cosmic, wrinkled and de-armored, even taking Galactus's helmet as a trophy, using it as the entrance to his throne room. So while you might have recognized him previously, Galactus then got super upgraded and now is very mummified and also very dead. Oof. Number 4. Onslaught Onslaught initially was a villain with a mysterious background. Despite the fact the powerful villain looked a ton like Magneto and seemed to pack a psionic powerhouse of abilities that echoed an evil Professor X, the character's true identity as really both of those mutants wouldn't be confirmed confirmed till after his initial appearance. When Onslaught appeared again, it was in a similar vein, and while the symbol of Onslaught might be similar, this time around when it came to the character's identity, they were even less recognizable as it was explained that 
basically all the mutants of Krakoa were in a way Onslaught, and that Onslaught was able to exist through their constant resurrections. So while you might recognize the look of Onslaught when they returned, their true identity was even more of a mystery than the first time around. And their final form that we saw during X-Men The Onslaught Revelation was pretty wild as well. Getting a bit of an update to match even the current character designs of what an amalgamated Charles and Eric would look like currently. I like that that version of Onslaught has like the black suit to now the tight black suit that Charles wears. It's a look. Number three, one below all. I think one of the biggest revelations of modern comics was learning that even a being as good as the one above all, who is basically considered to be like Marvel God, has a dark side. The one below all ended up being a major villain in the Immortal Hulk series, and we later learned that their power actually came from one of the most divine and good beings in the Marvel Universe, the one above all. The one below all is like the Hulk for the one above all. In other words, their darker and much more destructive other half. So while you might know the one above all, and you might know the one below all, I bet you'd be surprised to learn that they were actually directly connected to one another. They can't exist without the other, especially given how different in appearance and alignment they both are. But this revelation was also super powerful and fitting for a series that was really all about forgiving and reconciling the darker side of the Hulk, the Hulks, and ultimately of humanity and our own individual selves. After all, we all have like a little bit of a Hulk side to us. Number two, Killmonger. If you go on far enough back, Eric Killmonger easily becomes one of Marvel's villains you would not soon recognize. And that goes both ways. Whether we're talking about more recent fans looking back in comic history to his first appearance in Jungle Action, volume number two, or whether we're talking about his initial fans looking at his modern MCU adaptation and comic redesign, which obviously takes inspiration from the MCU version of Eric. Killmonger made his first appearance in the second volume of Jungle Action from the 1970s in issue number six. And even from that front cover, he just looks like really different. Here, Eric does not sport any self-created bodily scars marking his kills, but instead comes with a lot of spiky accessories, including what appears to be a spike belt, which he uses as a weapon to fight against his foe and his rival, Black Panther. All the spikes. Now he's got scars, but back then he had spikes. Number one, the leader. I doubt after all this time, if the leader even really recognizes himself, considering what he looks like now. Following the events of Immortal Hulk, the leader is left no longer a supervillain, but just a guy. Throughout the course of the series, we saw the leader only grow more evil and more more powerful it seemed. He was eventually basically influenced or possessed by the one below all, the most powerful of all Hulk related baddies, and possibly the baddest of the bad just in general. However, after the two beings were separated from one another, Stearns was left as just a man, returned to normal. The Hulk decided to forgive the leader and he returned back to the earth with all the other Hulks and Bruce Banner. It's been a long time, but Sam Stearns is no longer the leader, at least not currently in the comics. I mean, he could return to being the leader at some point. Instead, Samuel Stearns is just Samuel Stearns. Number 10, Nightmare. Nightmare is one of the fear lords who rules over the nightmare dimension of the dream dimension of the splinter dimensions of the dark dimensions. Nightmare rules over the nightmare dimension, which is where people go when they have nightmares. Let's just, let's just leave it at that. He is a fear lord, one of these guys, and he first appeared in Strange Tales 110 which is also the first appearance of Stephen Strange. So if you thought we were not covering Nightmare, you thought wrong. In the follow-up Doctor Strange story, the world is destroyed, and Doctor Strange goes to seek the help of Eternity, who is the physical embodiment of the Marvel Universe, only to find Nightmare captured Eternity in the dream dimension and subjected him to horrible dreams. Because Nightmare's powers are fueled by humans, it took a battle between the Ancient One and Eternity to convince Eternity to reform the Earth and human civilization. That's how scary nightmares are! He shows up occasionally, tormenting heroes in their dreams, and leaving his realm to depower him so that heroes can actually defeat him. Usually, it's Doctor Strange doing the hard work inside other people's dreams, though. Number 9, Kulin Gath. Kulin Gath was a sorcerer who lived in Earth's Hyborian era, aka the time of Conan the Barbarian. He actually isn't the original Kulin Gath, though. Well, he is, and he isn't. See, Kulin had a slave who poisoned him and assumed his identity. When this Kulin Gath set out the training of the then Sorcerer Supreme, Mekri Ra, he was refused. He responded by murdering and consuming the Sorcerer Supreme, gaining his power. As an enemy of Conan, 
Kulin was eventually beheaded by the barbarian, but not before he had become immortal by putting his essence in a magical amulet. It's that's a horcrux. After the amulet had made its way to Manhattan in the modern era, it ended up in the hands of a mugger who donned the amulet, allowing Kulin Gath to possess and transform the body of the mugger. Then. He transformed Manhattan into a replica of the time he came from, manipulated the minds of everyone there, and took control of the minds of the Avengers, X-Men, New Mutants, and Morlocks to hunt down Spider-Man. It took the combined powers of Doctor Strange and the mutant magic to change time so that the mugger was killed by Nimrod instead. You know you're a problem when people just go back in time to take you out. Number eight, Loki. At this point, I'm pretty sure everyone and their mom has heard of the god of mischief, Loki. If not from the MCU, then at least from the actual Norse mythology. So I'm not gonna go into a huge backstory spiel, but do you know how actually powerful Loki is? Obviously he is a god, and the number of benefits that come with that title are, well, he doesn't really need a plan, let's just say that. He is super strong, super durable, super fast, he's got a healing factor, and he lives for a hell of a long time. But more than that, Loki himself is an extremely powerful sorcerer. So powerful in fact that Loki even recently took on the role of Sorcerer Supreme through a little of his trickster ways. Let me tell you, it took Stephen Strange harnessing the full power of the world tree Yggdrasil, plus the strength of the century and more prominently the void, which is capable of destroying Asgard and has even killed Loki in the past for Doctor Strange to get the mantle back. Needless to say, Loki is an extremely powerful villain for most characters in the Marvel Universe, but as a sorcerer, he is a pain in the backside of our Sorcerer Supreme. Number 7. Baron Mordo You know that guy who is basically Stephen Strange's sidekick in the first movie? Yeah, yeah, that guy. That's Mordo. So Mordo was born in Transylvania, basically as a means of another sorcerer, this dude, gaining power. And when that all went kaput, Mordo was trained in the ways of black magic. At the age of 30, he went to Tibet to find and study with the Ancient One, and it's here that he eventually met our lovely boy Steven. Mordo didn't really dig strange though, and when Steven walked in on Mordo doing some nefarious planning to attack his master, Mordo cast a spell to stop Steven from warning Baldi. He's the bad guy though, and this is the origin story of Doctor Strange, so you can imagine how it didn't go too well for him. Steven became the Sorcerer Supreme, and Mordo left, continuing his studies of dark magic on his own time. He has always been a longtime rival to Strange, and the Ancient One, causing all kinds of mischievous activity, helping other villains like Dormammu, and joining multiple different mystic teams. As another powerful sorcerer, he has many abilities and spells equal to Doctor Strange, except He's got a fair dose of the old black magic, which is always a problem for bad guys. I'm super excited to see what part he plays in the multiverse of madness, especially with that hair. Damn, boy! Number six, Doctor Doom. He's got arguably the best lines in Marvel Comics. He rules Latveria. His mother sacrificed her soul to the devil to make him a monarch. He's got a huge ego, but not for no reason. I don't think there is a hero that hasn't come into some kind of contact with Doctor Doom, although he is primarily a Fantastic Four villain. His use of magic, though, brings him into interaction with the Sorcerer Supreme so many times. Doctor Doom was introduced to sorcery through his mother, but received a huge power boost when he sacrificed the soul of his former lover, Valeria, to the Hazareth Three, who in return granted him magical armor made of Valeria's skin and flesh. Couldn't it be me. With their power and his own sorcery, Doom can create mystical blasts and force fields, invoke entities, cast more powerful spells, reverse other spells, summon demonic hordes, teleport, travel to other dimensions, mystical ensnaring in portals, magically heal himself and others, banish others, time travel, absorb power, manipulate elements, perform telekinesis, nullify others' powers. And I think that's the list. But other than his sorcery, he is a super genius in the vein of Tony Stark, even eventually becoming Iron Man for a while. He's a master martial artist. He is at peak human condition. He's got great connections. He's super charismatic and just plays the piano like a pro. His biggest weakness is that damn ego. But there was a point in time where he was known as God Emperor Doom when he used the power of the Beyonders to create and rule over Battleworld, making the Sorcerer Supreme his sheriff. Like I said, he kind of has a right to possess such an ego. I mean, just look at him! Number five, Mephisto. Mephisto has always been somewhat of a background character, jumping up here and again in Marvel Comics, but with no real huge events to his name, although he has 
been a part of a few. Mephisto is an extremely powerful extra dimensional demon who very closely resembles the devil, but that may only be because it's the easiest way for him to use people's fears to his advantage. Mephisto's calling card is making bets, but they're never fair wagers. He always seems to get people in the wording of his deals. He'd probably make one hell of a lawyer. Usually Mephisto is asking people to put their souls or the souls of those they love on the line. Like with Doctor Doom's mother or Johnny Blaze. Or most recently when he and Doctor Strange had a bet that people weren't all that bad in exchange for Doctor Strange's soul. That kind of thing. In his own dimension, the Hell Lord is basically omnipotent. Although he can be defeated by someone who is smart enough or powerful enough. As a mystical entity, he's been a long time foe of the Sorcerer Supreme. And his most recent story, involving a hotel he sprouted up in the middle of Las Vegas, is just so quirky and fun. Number four, Umar. Umar of the Faltine is an insanely powerful being who is the sister of Dormammu. Umar ended up having a little bow chicka wow wow with Dormammu's disciple, Orini, which led to Umar giving birth. The sweet miracle of birth changed Umar making her incapable of turning back into her faulting form, depowering her significantly. This kinda drove her crazy and she lashed out at everyone, including her much, much more powerful brother, who banished her to a pocket dimension of the dark dimension. Quite the falling out. She loves her brother though, so when he's defeated by Doctor Strange and she's freed from her banishment, she goes on to try and avenge her brother. When she went to Earth to destroy it, however, she was defeated by another extremely powerful entity. But before we get on to that guy, I just wanted to say a quick thanks for watching from me and us here at Top 10 Nerd. I hope you're enjoying the video. If you are, why not give us a little like and tap that subscribe button. You are the reason we can do what we do. I love you guys. Alright, on to top three. Number three, Zom. When the aforementioned Umar invaded Earth and Doctor Strange could not defeat her, he needed some way to put her down. The Ancient One told Doctor Strange about the 20 foot, 18,000 pound interdimensional being, Zom. Doctor Strange was like, okay perfect, I'll just go summon him. Which he did, and Zom easily defeated Umar. But now he's free, and no one wants to be put back in the mystical slammer, so he turns on the Doctor. Zom is so powerful that there was absolutely nothing Doctor Strange could do. Even if all the reality warping heroes and all the Avengers combined forces, they would not be able to defeat Zom. It took the power of the Living Tribunal, the literal judge of the multiverse, who had not even been seen in Marvel Comics before this point, to whisk him away. And then the Tribunal scolded Doctor Strange for summoning a being who could literally wipe out the multiverse. He threatened to destroy Earth. It was that intense. Zom has no other goal than to completely annihilate and destroy everything, ever. Zom is one of the most powerful mystical entities in the entire Marvel Universe. And the Living Tribunal is the only person who has been shown to stop him. Number two, Dormammu. Dormammu is one of a race of extra dimensional energy beings called the Faltine. Him and his sister Umar are both mutants of the species, seeking to consume matter instead of energy, which, along with killing their pops, caused them to be banished. They both traveled to the dark dimension and eventually took it over, but we know what happened to their relationship afterwards. Dormammu is the prime enemy of the Vishanti the gods who give the Sorcerer Supreme his supreme merch, and is stated by Odin to be his equal in power. He is basically immortal and indestructible because of his energy body. He is more powerful than even the greatest sorcerers including Doctor Strange and the Ancient One, and he can banish anyone from his domain, the Dark Dimension, but usually fights them for a bit of the old sport. He also has super strength, astral projection, matter transmutation, interdimensional teleportation, flight, can change his appearance and size, he can control the elements, time travel, and project and absorb energy. He's also immortal and has a regenerative healing factor. Dormammu first appeared in Strange Tales number 126 when he threatened the Ancient One with an invasion. The old guy sent Doctor Strange to the Dark Dimension to face Dormammu. The eventual fight set mindless ones loose, causing Dormammu and Strange to team up. Dormammu promised not to invade Earth, but he got all bitter and petty and has been one of Strange's most fearsome enemies since. He's faced almost everyone on this list. Number one, Shuma Gorath. Shuma Gorath is one of the greatest of the leaders of the Old Ones, also known as the Many Angled Ones, which are a race of nightmare fuel. Think Lovecraft, so 10 tickles and madness and all that jazz. 
It is the ruler of hundreds of dimensions and is said to be older than the universe itself. It has many mystical powers, including the ability to communicate and control others across dimensions, create mystical energy blasts from his eyes and tentacles, and can transmute things on a planetary scale. He can destroy multiple galaxies with his aura pressure and can destroy realities by using his tentacles to create a ball of energy that he launches at reality. I'm sorry. Uh, does anyone else find the word tentacles funny? Anyone? They first fully premiered in Marvel Premiere Volume 1, Number 10. In the comic, they end up using the mind of the Ancient One, Doctor Strange's mentor, as a portal to the dimension of Earth. Doctor Strange goes into the Ancient One's mind to battle the defenses of Shumagorath and fight his way into its realm, only to realize that the only way to win is to kill the Ancient One. He's forced to do it. Starting at number 10, we have General Zod. This Kryptonian supervillain flaunts the same powers as Superman, but he's also got the know-how of a highly experienced army general, having held the title of Leader of Military Defense for the Science Council on Krypton. General Zod survived the destruction of Krypton and, after being released from the Phantom Zone, became a sworn enemy to Superman. This supervillain is fueled, like many others, by resentment and rage, believing that violence is the only way to make any real change in the world. I put him at the back of our list not to discount his powers, but purely because there are far more powerful beings to come. Number 9, Doomsday. This hyper-regenerative creature was created in a lab and designed to experience death over and over and over again, each time evolving past whatever had killed him the last time. Starting off as a seemingly regular baby, he has grown into a monstrosity that has experienced death so many times that he's become a tormented and I imagine exhausted creature that actually holds on to the memories of each experience. So imagine facing the pain of death almost endlessly for eternity, mostly inflicted by superheroes trying to rid the universe of you. You'd be pretty angry too. Doomsday even faces off against and defeats Superman at one point, so his power is not to be underestimated. But he just can't contend with some of the other godlike powers that other villains on this list possess. So, for that reason, he's a bit further back on the list, but once again, not to be discounted. At number eight, we have Hela, the eldest daughter of Odin. Hela is endowed with powers superior even to her younger brothers Loki and Thor most notably credited with effortlessly shattering Thor's hammer with one hand, this supervillain easily has the ability to rule not only the world, but the whole cosmos. Hela is basically a god, having a set of abilities that practically make her entirely omnipotent, with super strength, super durability, and immortality as long as Asgard existed, omnipresent, with super speed and super reflexes, and omniscient, with her almost endless knowledge of sword and hammer fighting hand-to-hand -hand combat, acrobatics, and military strategy. If anyone is capable of not only overpowering any good guys standing in her way, but also outsmarting them, it's Hela. Okay, at number seven, we've got the one and only Thanos. Probably the most widely popular on the list, it's not hard to imagine him taking over and ruling the world for obvious reasons. But I know some of you may be shocked to see him at number seven and not at number one, two, or three, because despite his undeniable strength and motivation to balance out the population of the universe, he wasn't able to do it alone. As we all know, Thanos' peak power relies on the Infinity Stones. So if he failed to obtain them, he may never have had the chance to be on this list at all. And as for his ability to rule the world, the best way I could see that happening would be through fear, keeping his enemies at bay by threatening to use the stones. But once the snap took place, he would still have half the universe to face if he were to try to take over the world. And that's sort of what happens, isn't it? He was tracked down and executed by Thor and the remaining Avengers. And whether we'd like to admit it or not, this shows, I know this sounds wrong, but a weak spot that other villains on this list just don't have. So Thanos is definitely capable of ruling the world as we know it, but there's an asterisk might need to undergo a bloody conquest to retrieve Infinity Stones first. At number six, we've got Darkseid, born as Euxus, Uxus, Euxus, probably Euxus, with royal status on the planet of Apocalypse. Darkseid was born with supreme power to his father Yuga Khan and mother Hegra. Posing as one of the primary threats in most Superman storylines, Darkseid dedicates his life to taking life away. His main accolade came when he came in contact with the Martians, who shared with him the life equation, at which point Darkseid in all his evil glory theorized that there must be an anti-life equation as well. Google the equation if you want, it's a real bummer. Yeah, so basically, <laughs> Darkseid is a bad dude. 
but who isn't on this list? What really sets him apart from the others is his ability to cheat death. When he's seemingly killed in a battle with his son Orion, his life force is able to live on past the destruction of his body and come back to get revenge killing Orion with a time-traveling bullet. If I wanted to continue exploring all of Darkseid's evil accolades, this part of the video would be 20 minutes long. So I'll just say this, Darkseid is more than capable of taking over the world, having had plenty of experience on Apocalypse. In fact, if he wasn't so obsessed with the anti-life equation, he probably would have done it 10 times over, at least. At number five, we have Superboy Prime. This young supervillain comes from a version of Earth, Earth Prime, where he is the only superhero in existence. He grew up loving the DC Universe, very meta, yes, particularly the Silver Age. But like ours, unfortunately, in his dimension, all these heroes are merely fiction, except for him. But after his home world is destroyed along with many other versions of Earth, by what is known as Crisis on Infinite Earths, he becomes more and more angry and resentful about the loss of his old life and turns to the dark side, killing many heroes and villains in his way. Now, he is after all credited, should I use that word? With defeating the Justice League, Earth 2 Superman, and the Teen Titans among others, and shattering none other than Anti-Monitor's armor. But since we're talking about ruling the world purely by his somewhat naive, angst-fueled view on reality, he might not be able to maintain rule over the world for long. But nonetheless, this super house of a villain has the perfect balance of dimension-shattering power, insecurity, and resentment to force his way into a position of supreme reign over the world as we know it. Okay, at number four, we've got Yuga Khan, the all-powerful first ruler of Apocalypse who was for a long time, considered the most powerful being in the universe. Father to Darkseid, this ruler fits right into our list because we're talking about not just powerful beings, which Yuga Khan undoubtedly is, but villains that could rule the world. And Yuga Khan had a lot of experience ruling over Apocalypse. His only downfall was that he wanted more power, which proved to be impossible. His attempt to uncover the source, which is defined as the cause of life itself, or the meaning of life, if you will, eventually destroyed him. This proved that even the most powerful being in the world was no match for the limits of the universe. However, it does still say a lot that his insatiable thirst for power was the only cause for his downfall because that very trait that Yuga Khan possesses is the very thing that would land him on this list. I mean, let's be honest, the first ruler of Apocalypse would have no problem ruling over our world as we know it, would he? I don't think so. Gosh, this is getting hard. To be honest, these top threes could basically be interchangeable. At number three, we have Galactus. Galactus is basically an interplanetary, interdimensional being that feeds on, yep, you got it, life. I'm sure you've seen this guy before on TV and comics in your nightmares. There's just something about him that makes me feel afraid for my life probably the part where he wants to consume it. Throughout the years in the Marvel Universe, Galactus has made many appearances, moving between worlds, taking what he wants, and often leaving planets bare of any life. What's terrifying and powerful about Galactus is that it's not like he's driven by some sort of anger or hatred for humanity and other life in the universe. He's just hungry. Every time he reappears with a vengeance, it's as though he's just trying to satiate a hunger that even he can't control. So if you were going to ask me if I think he could take over the world, I would say yes. If he could eat the world, he can rule it, I imagine. This guy is so powerful that when the Silver Surfer manages to turn Galactus's own energy siphoning machines against him, his true form is revealed to be a sentient star. So there's no real contest here with how powerful this villain is. The only asterisk I may put here is that in the context of this list, there's a chance that he doesn't pull off a very steady reign over civilization because as soon as he gets that insatiable hunger for life again, he'll have no world to rule. Number two on our list goes to Anti-Monitor, born on one of the moons of an evil dimension called Quard. Anti-Monitor is basically the manifestation of evil. He was created billions of years ago after a scientist named Krona tried to witness the origins of life itself. So he was created from, arguably, one of the original events that brought evil into the universe. Then there was a million year war with his good counterpart known as, you guessed it, Monitor. The results which was a draw. 
Boring. Then they both fell unconscious for 9 billion years. Even more boring. But the rest of this villain story is anything but boring. After his hibernation, he wakes up and destroys a whole universe. One of many in the future. You know why? Because another scientist, this one named Pariah, tried to observe the origins of the universe again. Anyway, Anti-Monitor becomes infinitely stronger from this, having created an antimatter universe and sets out to wreak more havoc. This guy belongs right at the top of the list because he seems to only appear when the very essence of evil is released into the universe. He's huge, he literally eats universes for breakfast, and as a little added bit to the resume, he's known as being pretty good at leadership, having led an army of Cordians and shadow demons on his conquest to take down whole universes. There's so much more to Anti-Monitor's story, and even though it sort of ends when Superman 2 kills him, I would argue that a villain that can consume whole universes could, if he so pleased, make a pit stop and rule the world for a bit. Maybe get bored of that, go and rule another world for a bit, and still make it home for dinner. And what would be for dinner, you ask? Probably another universe. There's no touching this guy. The only reason why I don't give him a number one spot is only because even though he'd be able to rule the world with ease, he'd probably not even choose to do so. His ambitions go way beyond conquering planets, so I mean, would his lack of interest be the very thing that got in the way of successfully taking over our tiny world? I'll leave that up to you guys. All right, at number one, we have a villain that ticks off all the boxes. He's extremely powerful, interdimensional, very, very evil, and has more mortal-like ambitions that would and have set his sights on ruling our world. And that is... Kang the Conqueror. Now, I know what you're thinking. This guy isn't a universe destroyer. Okay, but remember, this is a list about the top 10 villains who could rule the world. And out of everyone in the Marvel Universe, Kang is arguably the most powerful evil villain who deals primarily with earthly ambitions. He's able to travel through time like it's part of his daily routine, constantly posing as a major threat to the Avengers and the Fantastic Four, and constantly manipulating the outcome of events on Earth and beyond due to his superior hindsight. But beyond that, his resume is insane. Having already conquered thousands of worlds over a 100 light year conquest, destroying Washington DC, killing his own son, killing his own lover, trying to kill baby versions of the Avengers, and even killing past versions of himself, all to get to his final goal. Kang really stops at nothing to get what he wants, ignoring his love for even his closest allies and family members, and altering the course of multiple realities to see any outcome he desires. Also, he killed his lover because he was in limbo and basically got bored. This villain is the manifestation of fate. He chooses what happens in the world, and unlike the second on our list, he has many human-like traits that I would argue make him even more evil. There were early versions of Kang that were actually good, like Rama Tut and Mortis and Iron Lad, but he chose evil over good, and actively uses his almost infinite power to kill countless people, and mutants from the Marvel Universe as well. Almost all of them at one point. He's ruthless, has an evil tyrannous king, Henry VIII vibe, and would easily set his sights on our world if he so chose. And he has chosen, many times before, in many different timelines. At number 10, we have Annihilus. Using the cosmic control rod, Annihilus ameliorates his own well-being, spending most of his time trying to find ways to make himself, yes, immortal. The rod is known to have almost limitless capabilities, so his efforts aren't in vain as he has found ways to fend off disease, slowing down cellular degeneration, otherwise known as aging, and warding off heat and cold. He also uses it to fly super fast, which is another plus. The only reason why Annihilus is back at number 10 for me is that he seems to need the cosmic control rod to achieve immortality. And even while he has it, he's known to be liable to make big mistakes due to his paranoia that others are going to try and snatch it from him. Remember kids, the real superpower is up here. Number nine goes to Apocalypse. This villain, often facing off against the X-Men, originated in ancient Egypt, giving hints that he's capable of existing for hundreds of years at a time without meeting death. Yeah, so he's also known to have some supreme control over his body from an atomic level, being capable of growing in size and density whenever he chooses, and adapting to his environment and fighting off disease. Not only that, but he's immune to aging. Aging, again. So when Apocalypse was finally defeated by Cable, he wasn't actually killed and regenerated in a tomb in Aqaba. So there you have it. It seems like this guy will always be around. Our best bet is to keep him at bay for a while before he inevitably comes back, possibly repeating this process for eternity. 
All right, at number eight, we have Mephisto, a demon creature who presents similarly to how humans view Satan. And yes, he did this to manipulate our singular views of evil through our tale of Satan the fallen angel. Regardless, Mephisto is known to be so powerful that he does not need food or water or even oxygen to survive. He even has abilities to regenerate in the instances that he is damaged going as far as regrowing limbs. And he can also see his own future if he so chooses. So even if something was coming his way that could somehow usurp his seemingly immortal powers, he would see it coming and put a stop to it before it could reach him. Mephisto proves to be a threat throughout the ages and although he does face certain limitations to his powers and influence, this list isn't about power, but about immortality. So there you go. Number seven, we've got Anti-Monitor. Yes, this villain appears a lot, on these powerful villain super lists, but I couldn't ignore him on this one even if I tried. His influence in the comics is immense, but what places him in this list is primarily his near infinite age. This guy was born in the early days of the cosmos, lived for over 9 billion years in a dormant state, and even fought a battle with his counterpart, Monitor, for a million years. It's hard enough for most beings to live that long, let alone be in a constant battle the whole time. And on top of all this, he's also just proven to be nearly impossible to kill. Even when he's vanquished for good, he isn't really killed, but instead broken up into molecules and scattered through the universe. And he had to be punched into a star to make that happen. By Superman from Earth 2. With the help of Darkseid, Superboy Prime, Dr. Light, and Heroic Lex Luthor. So I'd argue that Anti-Monitor definitely deserves a spot on this list. Number six on our list goes to the one and only Kang the Conqueror. This villain is so powerful that he's able to change the course of history with little to no effort. His ability to traverse through time gives him supreme insight and also the capability to appear in any time in the history of our universe, future, past, and present. He's a real contender for this list because although he's been defeated in the past, he was really only in a state of limbo and he never truly meets a final end. I mean. He's able to not only design the outcome of reality in most cases, but also just exist in any time he'd like. He once lived in ancient Egypt, and also the turn of the 20th century. The point is, Kang shows time and time again that he's capable of existing in multiple times throughout history, which I would argue could be a form of immortality. As Schrodinger's logic would go, Kang has and hasn't existed at every moment in history and the future. It would just be up to us to observe him, and well, good luck with that. All right, at number five, I'm putting Dormammu. Am I pronouncing that right? Another villain who's been around for countless millennia, possibly even millions of years. Dormammu proves to be powerful enough and durable enough to possibly be considered immortal. One piece of evidence is his clash with Agamotto, a spawn of one of the elder gods where Dormammu actually held his own. And for those of you who don't know, Agamotto easily contended against Galactus himself. And if that wasn't enough to suggest Dormammu's potential for immortality, he's also immune to aging and harm of any kind, physical or mystical. His powers have also been used for resurrection in the past, so it's fair to say that stopping this guy will be tough and arguably won't be permanent in any case. Okay, at number four, we're looking at Searcher, the thousand foot tall fire giant who can move stuff with his mind. Searcher was the sworn enemy of Odin and Thor and eventually destroys Asgard. At a few points, Searcher is imprisoned and banished, but never completely destroyed. Even after one of these instances where Searcher was transported to the sea of eternal light and frozen for all time, he still re-emerges after a Norwegian guy named Sven finds a medallion with connections to Searcher and subsequently turns into him. Thank you so much, Sven. And once again, when he's finally defeated by the Asgardians, he isn't really, since he just finds himself resurrected in a realm called Muspelheim. There's one instance where he's then beheaded by the Twilight Sword, another where he's basically destroyed by Odin who steals the eternal flame from him, but based on his track record, I'm not buying that any of these instances are the last of him. We're in the top three, folks, and at number three we have none other than Thanos. I know, yes, in the movies he was beheaded, but many argue that this isn't the end of him. Thanos is an ancient Eternal who was born on the planet Titan to his father Alars, also an Eternal. So, this dates Thanos back about a million years. And Thanos himself is an Eternal, meaning we can at least deduct that he's immune to all disease and aging. In fact, Thanos was specifically banned by death from his realm, meaning it's almost confirmed that he can't be killed. So yeah, in the movie, spoiler alert, should have said that by now, we all saw him die. But by the laws of this character's storyline, this won't be the last we see of Thanos. 
no matter how severe the injury appears to be. Number two, we've got the insatiable Galactus. This bad guy is hardly a villain anymore and more like a floating entity that feeds on the energy of life forms. Interdimensional and one of the oldest known beings to ever exist, Galactus always finds a way to bring evil to the cosmos. Even in his apparent death, he was replaced by Abraxas who basically took over in his absence. As much as Galactus is able to endure and despite his nearly infinite age, there are instances where he's weakened and put into submissive positions by other forces in the cosmos. The closest he comes to truly dying is when Thor and Galactus's attempted assault on the Black Winter goes horribly wrong and Thor turns on him, leaving him on the brink of death. A little too late I'd say considering you just let him consume five planets Thor, but also good on you for killing Galactus sooner or later. But does Galactus ever die? Not really. Let's just hope that Abraxas doesn't come back again while he's gone. We don't want that. That guy's no good either. At number one, we have the Goblin Entity. This being was created at the point of the Big Bang, so one of the oldest on our list for sure. That said, the power of this villain has sustained over billions of years, and just like Galactus, it is driven by its insatiable hunger for energy. It's basically a giant, dark entity that moves through the cosmos, ingesting everything in its way. It is confirmed that the goblin entity cannot die, and if it were to be killed, similarly to everyone else on this list, it would find a way to regenerate. It seems what we're dealing with in this top 10 is a group of villains that just won't stop, no matter how hard you try to defeat them. But perhaps by exploring the villains with potential immortality, we're also exploring the deepest depths of true metaphorical evil found in the DC and Marvel universes. In that, in the real world as well, evil does always find its way back into the world. And all that can be done about it is temporary. Although those moments are sweet, where good wins, it's not long before we have to prepare for evil to return and rear its ugly head again. And it's at Yotad. Yotad overheard two brood half-reeds telling his boss that they allegedly killed the collector and had stolen his weapons collection. Yotad used this information to uncover the weapons cache and then attempted to trade them to another mob boss in exchange for a membership in his organization. But this mob boss named Diogo had other ideas. He betrayed Yotat, shooting him and then leaving for dead and then blowing up the weapons depot with Yotat inside. However, somehow he survived the explosion and was actually transformed by it. And when the world was transformed into Battle World for the Secret Wars storyline, Yotat caught up with Gyogo at the Sobolski Bar on Nowhere. After killing the man who betrayed him, Yotat was confronted by Rocket Raccoon. Rocket attempted to execute him for what he viewed as a murder, only to see that his blast had no effect. Drax the Destroyer then rescued Rocket raccoon by knocking Yotat unconscious and then the Nova Corps arrived to take him into custody. However later on he did defeat the Guardians after a few months but this guy looks awesome too. Just look at him. He looks badass. And at 9, the Collector. Tanalir Tavon is one of the oldest living beings in the universe. His species at Cygnus X1 was one of the first to evolve after the Big Bang. Death took Tavon as the last surviving representative of his species and then gave him total immortality. Tavon, as well as one of the representatives of each of the first species in the universe, cannot die. These people have associated among themselves to create the elders of the universe. However, after his wife Matani died, he learned that one of the factors of his immortality was the will to live, and Matani had lost lost hers. Tavon then decided that he would not suffer the same fate and looked for a goal to dedicate his life to. He then had a vision, seeing powerful things that would rise, determined to destroy the universe. And he decided to prevent this from happening and that he would dedicate his life to collecting artifacts and living beings throughout the universe and place them out of danger. Then after the destruction of the universe, he could repopulate it and bequeath the knowledge of cultures from the past. So he became the collector to continue being immortal, which is certainly an interesting origin story. And at 8, Ronan the Accuser. In the MCU, Ronan was a radical Kree warlord and former member of the Accusers. In 1995, during the Kree Skrull War, Ronan worked with Yon Rog and the Star Force after the ambush in Torfa to wipe out the last of the Skrull refugees. Ronan and the Accusers were then called to drop warheads on Earth to wipe out the remaining Skrull opposition there, but was forced to retreat when Captain Marvel launched a counteroffensive against the Kree. Promising retribution. 
you will get retribution. <laughs> Further disgusted by the peace treaty made between the Kree Empire and Xandar, Ronan initiated a new campaign to eradicate the Xandarnians by forging an alliance with Thanos, offering the orb in exchange for the destruction of Xandar. After a long search, Ronan did acquire the orb, but after having seen its true destructive capabilities, betrayed Thanos and chose to take the orb's power for himself. Using this newfound power, he attacked Xandar, only to be defeated and killed by the Guardians of the Galaxy in an iconic dance match. Battle. But honestly, with the power of an Infinity Stone, it's it's a wonder how he actually managed to lose. But that single stone still made him pretty damn powerful. And it's seven, Jason. Jason was the only son of the previous Emperor of Spartax, and therefore their sole heir to the throne. He was summoned by his father when the war broke out between the Spartax and the Badoon, and on his way back home he was forced to crash land on Earth, where he fell in love with a human woman named Meredith Quill. The two began a short relationship before Jason was forced to leave to wage war for the Spartax. Meredith would later go on to give birth to his son, Peter Quill. Yeah, that's right MCU fans, in the comics, Peter's dad is actually Emperor of Spartax and not Ego the Living Planet, which honestly makes more sense given that, you know, Ego is a whole ass planet. But years later, Jason joined the other members of the Galactic Council to declare Earth off limits to extraterrestrial interaction. Once his son defended Earth from a Badoon attack though, Jason sent Spartax soldiers to capture him and his team of Guardians of the Galaxy. However, the Guardians managed to escape and flee. And it's six, Thane. Thane is the secret inhuman son of Thanos. After a descendant inhuman tribe ran afoul of Thanos and his army, one inhuman woman returned home pregnant with Thanos' child. I don't even want to know how that worked. The son of Thanos was convinced by Jason that the X-Men and the Guardians had committed such a massacre in an attempt to remove him from the conflict, thus giving Thane a reason to join his side. After reacquiring the Black Vortex, Thane submitted to it. This increased his power by tenfold. Basically, the Black Vortex is like like a mirror like object that when you see your reflection it shows you the ideal version of yourself and then turns you into that ideal version. So yeah, this dude's powers increased a lot, turning him into an incredibly powerful villain. As part of his deal with Mr. Knife, Thane then used his cosmically enhanced power to encase the entirety of Spartax in his amber construct. The trapped Spartax would later be traded to the brood by Mr. Knife in exchange for it taking advantage of their expansion. A freaking cosmically enhanced son of Thanos. Yeah, that's pretty freaking powerful. That's nuts. Halfway through into number 5, Thanos. While usually portrayed as an evil bent villain, many th stories have alternately depicted Thanos as having a twisted moral compass and thinking that his actions are actually justified. The character's perhaps best known role came in the 1991 storyline of the Infinity Gauntlet, the culmination of several previous story arcs, which saw him successfully assembling the six Infinity Gems into a single gauntlet and then using them to wipe out half the universe's population, including many of its heroes, in an effort to earn the affection of Mistress Death. The the living embodiment of death in the Marvel Universe. Yeah, this dude wanted to get it on with death. Although these events were later undone, the storyline has remained one of the most popular published by Marvel, which was also later adapted into the MCU with the Infinity War and Endgame movies, which are the two highest grossing Marvel movies of all time, and the two highest grossing superhero movies of all time, which only serves to show the absolute power that the Mad Titan has over the Marvel Universe. Plus, he also managed to collect all the Infinity Gems and then wipe out half the universe just to get Lady Death on his dick. So, I mean, he's pretty crazy. Or dare I say, mad. In it for Ego. In the MCU, Ego was a celestial, a primordial and powerful being, and the biological father of Peter Quill. A living planet with a humanoid extension of himself, Ego sought to find meaning in his life and, to achieve this end, planned to remake the entire universe via an omnidicinal extinction level event known as the Expansion, using seeds planted on various worlds to terraform them into new extensions of himself, thereby eradicating all other life in the universe but himself. You get it? This process required two celestials, however. So, Ego traveled across the universe, siring children on humanoid and alien planets everywhere in an attempt to produce a celestial heir, eventually having thousands of children. Have you seen the show Seed? Yeah, it's like that. Ego hired the Yondu Ravager clan to abduct and transport some of these offspring to his planet, though none of them showed signs of having inherited celestial DNA. 
so he go killed them. <laughs> However, when he learned of a man from Earth who held an Infinity Stone without dying, he knew this must be the celestial son he had with Meredith Quill. But I think the most impressive part about this character is that not only is he a celestial, but he is also the commander from Sky High, meaning that technically Peter Quill is Will Stronghold. And honestly, that's a theory I can get behind. Sky High is a good movie. You should watch it. If you haven't seen it, watch Sky High. Penultimately, in number three, Zeus. Zeus is a member of the Olympians, a group of humanoid beings that hail from the pocket dimension of Olympus. He was worshipped by the humans of ancient Greece and the Roman Empire. He is supreme monarch of the Olympians, god of the heavens, sky, and weather. Kinda like the three Doris Pokemon. From, from Gen 5, from Black and White, Thunderous, Landorus, and Tornadus, yeah. Zeus was the youngest son of the Titan Kronos, who ruled Olympus and Rhea. The Titans were the offspring of the sky god Uranus and the primal earth goddess of Gaia. Kronos overthrew his father's rule by fatally wounding him, and then the dying Uranus prophesied that Kronos would be overthrown by his own children, which I guess is kind of poetic. As a result of this though, upon the birth of each of his own children, Kronos had them imprisoned in Tartarus, the most despicable section of the extra dimension known as Hades. Yeah, hell. However, appalled by the mistreatment of their children, Kronos' wife Rhea concealed their sixth pregnancy from him and secretly gave birth to Zeus, and then gave the infant Zeus to Gaia for safekeeping. I don't know why I need to explain how a literal god of Olympus is a powerful villain. Like, do I? Do I really need to do that? I don't think so. I should have just said Zeus and then moved on. But ultimately, in number two, Galactus. Galactus is the sole survivor of the sixth incarnation of the multiverse. Originally, Galactus was a humanoid named Galen, born in the previous incarnation of Earth 616 on planet Ta, a paradise like world whose civilization is said to have the most advanced of any of the known universe at the time. However, the sixth infinity and all its universes were in their final stages of collapse due to the multiversal renewal cycle, being consumed by the abstract entity known as the Black Winter. When the cosmos was going to meet its natural end, Galen was then approached by the embodiment of the Six Infinity, the sentience of the multiverse basically, who merged its essence with the mortal Galen. This way giving birth to a new entity that would survive the multiversal renewal, Galactus, the devourer of worlds. However, the Black Winter also presented an alternate account of these events, saying that Galen's survival was it sparing him, and then turned him into Galactus to mark him as its herald. Galactus possesses the immeasurable power cosmic, and is one of the most powerful beings in the Marvel Universe, having near limitless godlike powers, and being considered an omnipotent entity. He's mega OP if he's eaten enough worlds. And that's kinda like me. I relate. And finally, in at number one, Michael Korvac. Being first introduced in Giant Size Defenders number three in 1975, Michael Korvac's father was killed due to events surrounding his birth in 2977. He was raised by his mother, but when the solar system he lived on on Earth 691 and its colonies became the target for the Brotherhood of Badoon, Michael became a traitor and helped the Brotherhood. However, after a few moments of hesitation, he was cut in half and fused with his computer by the Brotherhood, turning him into a cyborg of sorts. But this seemed to do more harm than good, at least for the Brotherhood, since now Korvac was dead set on killing those who did this to him. So, way to go. At least until the Grandmaster transported him to battle Doctor Strange and the Defenders. Korvac intentionally lost this battle and instead siphoned some of the Grandmaster's power using his new cybernetic abilities, making him even more powerful than before. Eventually, this guy ends up impersonating Kang the Conqueror and the Watcher, and with his ability to siphon power from others, this makes him one of the scariest villains in the Marvel Universe. At least if he was smart about it and didn't get himself killed. He ends up wiping himself out of existence after killing basically all the Avengers and the Guardians though. It's freaking nuts, okay?